This video is mostly for Apple fans, or I suppose it's also for people who are considering getting into Apple's ecosystem. We need to talk about Apple One. Famously, Apple has always made the majority of their money from their hardware products, Macs, iPads, iPhones. But over the last few years, Apple has been committed to increasing its revenue from services. They've slowly introduced services here and there, starting with iCloud back in 2011. Later on, Apple Music, Apple TV Plus, Fitness Plus, News Plus, and Apple Arcade. It seems Apple's thirst for services revenue knows no bounds as they introduce more and more paid services. Then in late 2020, Apple announced Apple One, the all-in-one bundle in which you can get most or all of these services together for one price. So here we are nine months later and I'm sure Apple has picked up a ton of subscribers for their Apple One plan, but some people are still on the fence. So here's the most important question that we can ask. Is Apple One worth it? Let's dig in. So let's start with the basic question. What is Apple One? Well, it's a subscription bundle. So instead of buying one service, you buy multiple for one price. But it's not just one bundle, it's three, because Apple One has three tiers. Individual for $15.95 a month, which gives you Apple Music, TV Plus, Arcade, and 50 gigabytes of iCloud storage. Apple says that you save about $7 a month by bundling these together rather than purchasing separately. Then there's the family plan for $20.95 a month. This is meant to be shared with up to six other people. You get Apple Music, TV Plus, Arcade, and 200 gigabytes of iCloud storage. The savings here is about $10 versus buying these services separately. But if that's not enough for you, you can get Apple One Premier for $33.95 a month. That comes with Apple Music, TV Plus, Arcade, two terabytes of iCloud storage, plus the addition of Fitness Plus and News Plus. There's a whopping $32 savings by bundling. There's a pretty wide range of options. Let's quickly dive into each service to see if they're half decent. So we have to start with the OG service, iCloud, and that's not technically true. iCloud was preceded by an older service known as MobileMe. MobileMe was essentially a baby version of iCloud, which was infamously plagued by issues and bugs. But it paved the way for iCloud, which I have to say is simply indispensable. If you're using an iPhone, you really need to be using iCloud as well. Most of you know what iCloud does, so I'll breeze through this here. Basically, it's cloud storage to be used along with your Apple devices. Most people use it for essentials like contacts and calendar syncing, notes storage, and as a device backup. So if your iPhone gets lost, stolen, or broken, you can get a new iPhone and simply load your most recent backup almost as if nothing had happened. I think the vast majority of people also use it for photo storage. It's certainly prudent to back up your photos to the cloud. And while it's devastating when someone loses their iPhone along with years of photos, that's kind of their fault if they fail to utilize some kind of backup. And there's nothing more convenient than iCloud. Simply take photos and they get automatically backed up to the cloud. There's other uses for iCloud too. There's a files app, which means you can upload anything. Also, iMessage uses iCloud storage for message syncing across multiple devices. Plus, third-party apps can take advantage of iCloud storage if they use Apple's APIs. Apple's iCloud pricing actually starts at free, which is a nice bonus and it's an easy way to get people's feet in the door. But Apple has definitely faced some criticism because their free tier has a relatively small storage limit of five gigabytes. That is a laughably small amount of storage. Even Google offers 15 gigabytes for free. However, you can go to the paid tiers, which are 50 gigabytes for $1.29, 200 gigabytes for $3.99, or two terabytes for $12.99. Like I say, iCloud is indispensable, so I'm gonna have this service no matter what. 
whether it's tied to Apple One or on its own. Shifting gears here, I'll bring your attention to Apple Music. I actually did a video on music streaming services a few months ago. You can check out the link to that in the description below. As I compared Apple Music, Spotify, Amazon Music, as well as YouTube Music. In many respects, Apple Music is as good or even better than Spotify. For example, if you're a family, Apple Music as a standalone service is actually a little bit cheaper than Spotify. It's $14.99 versus $15.99. And Apple Music is well known for exclusives and getting access to certain albums or songs just a little bit sooner than competing apps like Spotify. That was actually the case a little bit more in the past. Apple Music is available in a lot of places. Of course, you can get it on your Apple devices. You can even get it on Android, but there's still some places where you can't get it that you can get Spotify. A couple examples, Apple and Google still haven't worked out a deal to allow Apple Music streaming on Google Home products in Canada. It's available in the States, so it's not a technical limitation as it is a legal one. I also can't listen to Apple Music on my PlayStation. Listening to music while gaming is a pretty big must, so it's kind of baffling that Apple still hasn't figured that out with the console makers. And just generally, they don't have their music app on as many platforms as Spotify. Spotify has an app everywhere, on every tablet, game console, smart TV, anything else you can imagine. Apple Music is lagging behind in that respect, which unfortunately kind of makes it a deal breaker for a lot of people who have those specific use cases. All right, let's talk about Apple TV+. Plus. Apple announced their streaming service back in late 2019. It has since gone on to become the next Netflix. Okay, not quite. Apple TV Plus isn't like Netflix at all, actually, and they aren't really trying to be. Apple TV Plus is all about originals, so it's content that Apple has the exclusive rights to. I'll skip ahead here and get right to the main point. Apple TV Plus isn't a must have service at this point. They've had a couple of hits here and there, but it's probably not worth paying for a subscription all year round. Maybe you'll pick it up when you need to, when there's like a show you wanna watch, for example. Or maybe if it's bundled with an Apple One service, you're cool with that. But you can kind of see what Apple's doing here. By bundling, they can entice people to pay for their weaker offerings by combining them with their stronger offerings. All that said, I think Apple has had a couple of good moments on their TV service thus far. Notably, Ted Lasso has been a standout series, which was truly a runaway hit when it came out and received a ton of critical acclaim for its wholesome, hopeful storyline. Apple delivered a solid original movie with Greyhound as well, a World War II seaborne thriller starring Tom Hanks. Apple is slowly building its catalog and getting to a good release schedule. There's definitely some interesting shows that are just released or upcoming, such as Schmigadoon starring Keegan-Michael Key and the sci-fi saga that's upcoming foundation. You can watch Apple TV Plus on an Apple TV device, but Apple also has the TV app on the iPhone, iPad, Mac, as well as streaming sticks, smart TVs, and game consoles. In the world of gaming, you've got different types of gamers. Hardcore gamers tend to game on PC, but there's still a lot of highly competitive gamers on console. Then there's casual gamers who game mostly on mobile platforms like iPhone and iPad. Now, the term casual can be a little bit misleading. Mobile games is actually a massive industry worth about $100 billion in 2020. Plus, people can get hooked on mobile games just like they can computer games to the point at which it becomes a dangerous and destructive pattern of behavior. So what is Apple Arcade all about and what kind of gamer are they going for here? Apple Arcade is a video game subscription service that Apple launched in late 2019. The point of Apple Arcade is to provide a curated selection of games that can be played on Apple's different platforms, iPhone, iPad, 
Mac, and Apple TV. There's currently over 180 games that are available in the arcade. Most of the games are exclusives, or at least the version of the game is exclusive to Apple Arcade. The games are hand-picked according to what Apple thinks users will find most interesting. There are no ads or even any in-app purchases in Apple Arcade games, which is pretty compelling. Gaming seems like it's all ads these days or an endless stream of in-app offers to get some kind of loot boxes to make faster progress or something like that. So it's genuinely refreshing to know that any game you download will be stress-free in that regard. Apple Arcade on its own costs $5.99 per month and you can share that access with the whole family. Like I say, I'm not a huge gamer. I do have a PlayStation 5, which I did an impressions video on a while ago, but I'm a social gamer. I really only jump on to play games when I'm going to meet up with friends online. And as far as mobile games, I really never play them. So this service isn't geared towards me. If anything, I would say it's actually geared towards families. I think parents probably find comfort knowing that any of these games their kids play are vetted by Apple for quality, but also knowing that there won't be a surprise in-app purchase that shows up on the credit card, for example. Plus. $5.99 per month is relatively cheap compared to buying games for other platforms or game systems. So the longer you can keep your kids on Apple Arcade before they graduate up to game consoles or PCs, the better. There's almost every type of game you can imagine. I haven't heard of or played most of the games, but there were a few classics that I noticed Apple has now included that I remember playing on iPhone in years past. Games like Fruit Ninja, Cut the Rope, Angry Birds, and Leo's Fortune, games that felt so novel years ago. Most of them have been remastered for today's graphic standards, so they look better than ever. But beyond that, I wanted to play a few games to just get a feel for what's being offered here. I played most of these games on my Mac, but the majority of the games are on multiple platforms. Here's my one word reviews. Warp Drive on the Mac, bad. Sonic Racing, okay. Ocean Horn 2, Okay. Ultimate Rivals The Court? Meh. Outlanders on Mac? Okay. Mini Motorways on iPhone? Bad. SpongeBob Patty Pursuit? Okay. Keep in mind, these are my initial impressions after playing these games for maybe 15 minutes each. Still, I struggled to find a game that I found both interesting and engaging enough to hold my attention for more than 20 minutes. I'll keep trying games out though. There's a couple of games I wanna try out, like What the Golf and the latest version of Alto's Odyssey, The Lost City. But otherwise, I'll probably leave Apple Arcade to the kids for now. Moving on to Fitness Plus, this is Apple's entry into the fitness class market. Apple has been fitness focused ever since they launched the Apple Watch and their main innovation being the use of three separate rings that track different types of activity, movement, exercise, and standing. Apple Watch is the best selling smartwatch and holds the largest market share. So they must be doing something right. I'm certainly an avid Apple Watch user. And that's what Fitness Plus is meant to be paired with. You need to have an Apple Watch in order to use Fitness Plus. Apple is going head to head against other online fitness services like Peloton. Fitness Plus has 10 different workout types. Treadmill walk, treadmill run, hit, rowing, dance, cycling, yoga, core, strength, and mindful cool down. I've done six of them so far. Cycling, hit, mindful cool down, strength, core, and yoga. I haven't tried dance, although I should. And then rowing and the two treadmill ones, I don't have the equipment for. Apple has a great presentation overall. Once you start the workout on your TV or iPhone or whatever you're using, your watch automatically starts and stops the workout at the right time, which is great because I've left my workouts going far too long, many, many times. Plus you can view your active calories, your heart rate, workout time, and more right on the screen, depending on the device you're using. Apple has a special innovation called the burn bar, which shows you how hard you're working compared to the thousands of others who've also done the workout, all that data gets synced anonymously. I've had an overall positive experience with the workouts. Some have been better than others, 
and some of the instructors I prefer over others too. But that's pretty normal stuff. You have to find what works well for you. But my experience was completely different from that of my partner. She only tried a couple of workouts, but quickly lost any interest in it. She pointed out several shortcomings, which I didn't even realize. She thought the instructors weren't super motivating or engaging. She also disliked the lack of audible cues, like when a certain move is coming to an end and the instructor doesn't always even point it out either. That's a pretty small thing that's pretty common on other platforms. There's always modification options to make the workouts more accessible accessible, but they kind of feel like an afterthought and they aren't always clearly shown. There's also a lack of different playlists and programs. There's a few like workouts for beginners, for example, but it would be nice to have more options so you could better filter the type of workout you want. For example, I might want a hit workout, but with no jumping. Because of a lack of filters and also a very vague description of the actual workout, sometimes you might end up clicking a workout that's 100% jumping. Last and possibly least, there's News Plus. Apple News Plus has several different selling points, but the basic premise that's the most compelling is that it gets rid of the annoying paywalls in the news app. Apple is really playing the ecosystem game with this one. You know, install a default app on the iPhone, simply called News. Most people are gonna use that rather than go and find their own news app. Then just lock 50% of the articles behind a paywall. It's pretty smart. Basically, Apple News Plus unlocks what they call the premium content in the news app that's on the iPhone, iPad, and Mac. They have a bunch of newspapers signed onto the deal as well. The big ones from Canada being the Globe and Mail and the Star, and some international ones like the Los Angeles Times, and the Wall Street Journal. You also get access to hundreds of magazines. I don't keep up to date with magazines really, but there's a lot of recognizable publications like Canadian Geographic, Maclean's, Men's Health, Reader's Digest, Rolling Stone, The New Yorker, Vanity Fair, Women's Health, and a ton more. This is a no brainer if you like magazines. And you could definitely save hundreds of dollars in subscriptions or one-time purchases. Okay, so the News Plus experience is pretty good overall, but there's still one annoyance here. You know the ads that are all over the news app? Yeah, well, if you buy Apple News Plus, those don't go away. I honestly feel that's a bit of a strange move coming from Apple, but it is what it is. All right, so that is Apple one. There's definitely a lot there and I think it's pretty clear that there's a ton of value in subscribing to this all-in-one bundle as long as you're all in on the Apple ecosystem. For me, I don't know if I'm quite there. It probably just comes down to which services do I really want and dollars and cents. For example, you can take a look at what services you're interested in and figure out the cost differential from there. Apple is quick to point out that if you want every service, it's a no brainer. But what if you only really want some of them? Like if you aren't into the fitness or maybe news, well, getting rid of one of them still makes it worth it. Even getting rid of both of them. iCloud is the one I don't think anyone is getting rid of. $12.99 seems like a lot for iCloud and you can get the cheaper plans, but I just looked the other day and we're pretty much at 200 gigabytes now, which means we would soon have to upgrade anyways. Arcade, you probably only care about if you're into games. Get rid of that and it's actually still worth it. So even if you only want Apple's three most popular services, it's still worth it to get Apple One. Well, here's my situation. I really want iCloud. I also personally want Fitness Plus because I've been really enjoying it. I'm okay to pay for Apple TV as well. And I already have a subscription to Spotify family plan, so I don't need Apple Music and I won't play the games too much from Arcade. And as for news, it's nice to get rid of the paywall, but probably not worth the price just for that purpose. So just these three services brings me down to $31.97 which is so ridiculously close to the Apple One price that I may as well just pay for Apple One. Plus, if I go all in on Apple One, I can get rid of the Spotify account, saving me another $15.99. So long story short, I'm not fully bought in, but just thinking about simple mathematics, it makes perfect sense for me to subscribe to Apple One Premiere. You'll have to do your own exercise and your own math, but I would suggest it probably makes sense for many people. It's almost like Apple did the market research and figured out the perfect price point 
where it would be an easy sell most of the time and yet still find a way to extract just a few more dollars from all of their users. Well played, Apple. Thanks so much for watching the video. If you found it interesting, click that like button so that more people can get recommended this content and subscribe for more technology, Paul. Thanks, and we'll see you in the next one.